You don't know what it's like to have 54 minutes of every hour accounted for eight hours a day. You don't know what it's like to work an 80 hour week and that's a soft week. It can go as high as 90, it's two full-time jobs. You don't know what it's like to be responsible for children and parents and program and facilities and, and equipment and have no administrative support. Don't ever look a music teacher in the eye and tell them how busy you are. I am so excited to bring you today's conversation with the one, the only, Scott Lang. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations, and I had the opportunity to see Scott Lang speak live in Tampa, Florida a couple years ago. Scott was the keynote speaker for the American String Teachers Association Conference, and this is the sort of thing Scott does. He travels all over the place talking to music educators and students about leadership, about the profession, and he is such a fantastic speaker, as you'll hear in this podcast episode. ScottLang.net is his website, and he has this amazing project called Be Part of the Music. We dig into this and so much more, so many great topics. I know you're going to love today's conversation, and definitely check out the show notes. We've got everything linked up to there. And if you are not following Scott already, follow him on Facebook, follow him on Twitter, and get on his email list. He is one of my favorite writers in any subject, and he will have you laughing, thinking, crying, fuming along with him and so many topics related to music education. Can't say enough good things about Scott. So let's dive into this conversation. And before we do that, quick shout out to our sponsors, Upton Bass, D'Addario Strings, the A440 Violin Shop, and Bass Violin Shop. We'll hear more from them later in the episode. All right, here we go with our conversation with Scott Lang. How the heck did a percussionist and a band director end up going 200 days a year on the road with this crazy career of yours? <laughs> this is a funny story. So I always had, I always say, follow your passions. And I have two passions in life, leadership and music education, and not in that order. Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, the theory is if you put your avocation and your vocation together, then you'll be a happy person. So I took my avocation which was um, in leadership development. I was passionate about doing it with my own band kids and doing it with other band kids. And I paired it with my vocation, which was um, music education. Now, so my roommate and I at the time, which probably the greatest thing that ever happened to me is I didn't get married until I was 36. So I had a a buddy of mine who's like, hey, I need a roommate. He's a band director. I need a roommate. I'm a band director. We thought it would be six months. Um, We were roommates 12 years. And so that's all we did was talk shop. And so I would train his kids and he would train my kids and we were really passionate about the singing. One day we're like, we should open up a drum major camp. So we did. And um, after it kind of grew and evolved, um, we used to bring out Tim Lotzenheiser. And so um, I was doing some work at the camp and Tim was in the back of the room and he walked up after me and he said, you really ought to think about doing this. Um, You know, I think you could do this for a living. So, you know, after ruminating on it for a year or two, I actually, um, I got married and, um, and thought, well, I'm going to have kids soon. If I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. So I took the leap out the window and decided I was going to try it. What I think is interesting is I had this epiphany, like I've been doing this 14 years, about two years ago, I had this epiphany. I was on the road one day and someone asked me, and I said, oh, Tim Lawson, how's this? I went, wait a minute. I think Tim says that to everyone. I was just the one who was stupid enough to believe him. Like, I think I made this huge leap based on an act of stupidity, not talent. And Mm -hmm. I just fell into some good fortune and good luck. And um, I've been doing this now for uh, 14 years. And that was about as long as you were band director too, right? Uh, Yeah. I'm I'm coming up on the point where I I have been speaking more than I was a teacher. I taught 16 years. I taught um, a year and a half in East LA. That was a trip. Um, and then, um, and then I taught, uh, 14 years in, uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. For music educators, it's all about finding a fit that's good for you. I found mine when I was a high school teacher in the Chicago suburban schools and Scott had experiences in the Los Angeles area and in Arizona before moving into this public speaking role. And we talk about just the whole concept of finding your fit. You know, first of all, I think it's important that everyone finds their fit. And I talk to teachers a lot about this. I think while I may or may not have the skill sets, classroom, organizationally speaking and musically speaking to teach in the affluent suburbs, you know, that's not my fit. 
I'm fairly brash. I'm, I'm, I can be brazen and I say what I think and think what I say. And that doesn't always match up well with the affluent suburbs and involved parents. So, you know, when I talk to teachers, I talk about finding your fit. I've only taught in underserved low SES communities because it's not because, oh my goodness, I have such a good heart and I want to help. It's because that's where I'm comfortable and that's the clientele I'm comfortable with. And that's where I find my greatest joy. So, you know, when you talk about finding your journey forward, I never left that community. I, the schools I taught in were always in those communities because that's where I was the happiest. And it's interesting because I think teachers have these these visions of grandeur and dreams of, of grandioseness of I'm going to conduct Mahler and I'm going to conduct on the stage of Midwest. And I always say, you just might be dreaming wrong. You know, are you a person that can take nothing to 90 or you, are you a person that can take 90 to 100? And those are two very different skill sets. And are you a person that wants to take a kid who has nothing and give them something? Or do you want to take a kid who's got everything and help them find something? And those are two very different skill sets. Are you a person that wants to work with large bodies and help the individuals? Are you the person who wants to help the individual become a large body? And once you understand that, it's it, you put your ego aside and say, it's not about the this, the stick technique. It's about where am I the most comfortable? Where do I find the most joy? And where can I do the most good? And I, I really, I, I feel bad because I think, you know, one of the things that leads teachers away from this profession is failing to truly recognize, understand, and accept who they are and where they do the most good. Um, and so they, they set themselves up for failure. So to long winded way of answering your question, how did it, I don't think it was any different of a journey. Um, it was just me being me. And when opportunities presented itself, I, I took the leap. You know, it's, I, I had a fascinating journey through the teaching world. I, I freelance, I taught private lessons a long time. And then I got into, went back, got certified. And I remember so clearly that first moment of getting in front of kids, that Mr. Holland's opus kind of moment where you're like, you know, like, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm not going to be conducting Mahler anytime soon with these, with these kids. But then I learned to love it. And in such a different way than I expected. And, and it also reminds me of, uh, uh, chapter in uh, Seriously, talking about being an ensemble director versus being a music teacher. And that's something that I think about so much. Can you talk about that concept? Yeah, absolutely. So I, it, it comes from, a, it, that's from the chapter called Miss Moran and Her Waltzing Children. And that came from a moment in which I was doing what I call indentured servitude. My wife calls it volunteering in my son's school. But I, I, man, I, she does it every day and God, she's a saint because that is torture to me. Like, and I'm a school teacher, but I'm not an elementary school teacher. And that goes back to the conversation we just had. But my son, after doing my two and a half hours of indentured servitude said, dad, will you come to my special? And I'm like, well, what's a special? And he said, it's music. And I thought pretty highly of myself. Well, <laughs> oh, absolutely. You bet I'm going to. And I watched this teacher um, to make a long story short, from the moment she opened the door, she sang in intervals. And when they came in, they were dressed and covered and she had them in files and rows and she had them dancing around the room literally while she played piano, waltzing around the room, talking about three, four, and they would tiptoe when it was pianissimo and stomp when it was forte. And they would slide their feet for legato and, and, and click clack when it was staccato. And I watched her and I thought, my God, she taught more music theory in two and a half minutes to my six year old son than I taught in four years of high school. Mm -hmm. And I had this epiphany of, oh my goodness, she's a music educator. I'm an ensemble conductor. And those are two very different things. And they're not better or worse. They're just different. And the, the problem, I think, one of the problems in our profession is we associate student success with teaching success. Well, my ensemble sounds good, so clearly I'm a good teacher. Or I'm playing grade level six literature. I'm a grade level six teacher. I placed 14 kids in all state. No, the private lesson teacher plays 14 kids in all state. Let's be clear about that. The thing is, some of the best teaching and learning happens with some of the worst sounds. And I've seen some awful teaching and learning with some very fine sounds. And I think it's important that, that we understand that student success does not mean educator success. And educator or ensemble success doesn't necessarily mean teacher success. Now, they can go hand in hand and should go hand in hand, but they don't always. 
And you know that that comment I make, and one of my friends gets mad. He says it's condescending. I don't mean for it to be. Einstein is credited with a statement um, called that says basically all life on this planet would end within 14 years if if the honeybee disappeared because honeybees pollinate, pollinate produce flowers, flowers produce fruit, fruit is something for the animals, animals get eaten by their animals, so on and so forth. He didn't actually make that statement, but he did validate it. He's a repeater of that statement. And I say elementary and general music teachers are the honeybees of music education. Without them, all music's gone in 14 years. And we don't recognize the importance and the significance of their work often enough. And I'm just as guilty of it when I taught. I would visit my middle school teacher because, by goodness, he fed me. But if I saw my elementary teachers once a year, that was a good year. And I, I'm no better or worse than anyone else. But I think it's important, and one of my missions is, and one of the rationale and reasons for be part of the music is to recognize the work that happens where the sounds are the most offensive. We're going to take a quick break to thank our sponsor, Upton Bass. And here's a great story from David White, former podcast guest and New York-based Broadway musician about how he acquired his Upton Bass. I have to mention Upton Bass in Connecticut because those guys have really bailed me out and Eric specifically has become a good friend. He's a very, very nice guy. The story of my upright is my grandmother, who I was very close with, passed away before my senior year of high school. And she was always a very big supporter of me playing And uh, she always came to every concert, was the loudest cheerleader. Anyway, when she passed away, she was kind enough to leave money for me to be able to purchase a professional instrument. And for a long time, I had been looking around, trying to find some stuff. And I said, you know, I I really like these vintage instruments, but, you know, I didn't want to spend 30, 40 grand on something that I just kind of liked. So just kind of searching, I stumbled upon Upton and I said, you know what, I think I want to get a new instrument built, something to my specifications. And it was also very an an, an intensely personal process for me because of because of the history with my grandmother. Anyway, I went to them and they bent over backwards to make this beautiful seven eighths bass. And I had gotten it. I was playing a tour of Guys and Dolls and I set it on a chair and my foot got caught in a cable and down she went and I cracked mm-hmm. off the entire scroll. Now, the funny thing was I happened to be in New London, Connecticut, which is about six miles down the road from their shop. So uh, Dave, who runs their website, ran over, gave me a rental base, took my, my damage base, went away with it and uh, fixed it up. Thank you also to Diderio Strings and their Zyx strings are super cool strings if you haven't tried them out. Here's a clip of me playing them on my Jackstat bass. <laughs> I love that open ringing sound that they get with the bow. It's a wonderful solo sound. And of course, they sound great for pizzicato as well. Learn more at ContrabassConversations.com slash strings. All right, back to our conversation with Scott Lang. You're making me think of all the times I spent like printing up the Allstate results for my school, you know, posting. I was at one of those affluent suburban schools you speak of, right? Yep. We had the number one uh, amount of students in the in the state, you know, and it was like a big deal if we didn't that next year. I remember putting up the Midwest poster and then four years later, the next Midwest poster, you know, when we played. And and I'm as you're, as you're describing this, I'm thinking about even though I didn't go and visit the elementary schools, man, I spent, it must have been 80 hours a week at, at school, right? At school, after school, going to every single concert. Yep, it is. It's eight hours a week. It's a solid eight hours a week. And it would just incense me when people said, oh, you're a teacher. Oh, you got your summers off. You got time off every holiday off. And I'm like, you don't get it. You know, they, like, like no, you can't. Here's the thing. It's ignorance. Yeah. And, and part of it's ignorance and part of it is vanity. It, and it, it really, it frustrates me. And, you know, I used to, get as incensed as you do now. I just let people think what they think. But here's something, you know, that, that people don't understand. It's, you know, I, as a part of this, be part of the music, I've immersed myself in sponsorships and the business world. It means I've spent a lot of time working in the business world. And I was talking to someone, you know, and um, they, we were having a lunch meeting over this thing. And it was an hour and a half of ad nauseum detail and, and innuendo and I's and T's. And at the end of it, you know, that the, um, the business person who's in music education looked at me and said, well, I've, 
I'm just so swamped. And I said, I looked at him, I said, can I be honest with you? And he said, sure. I said, don't ever say that to a music teacher because it makes you look like a moron. I'm sorry, it does. You don't know what busy is till you've had four minutes to get a gulp of coffee, prep for the next class and pee. And that's if you're allowed to pee. You don't know what it's like to have 54 minutes of every hour accounted for eight hours a day. You don't know what it's like to work an 80 hour week. And that's a soft week. It can go as high as 90. It's two full time jobs. You don't know what it's like to be responsible for children and parents and program and facilities and and equipment and have no administrative support. Don't ever look a music teacher in the eye and tell them how busy you are. It's insulting to them. Visions of conducting Mahler and then fast forward two years and I'm, I'm getting really good at ordering the buses, right? <laughs> oh, no, let's be honest. I have a master's degree in copier repair. Let's just be clear about that. There is no, the copier repairman called me when there was a question because Ben, I could make that thing sing like it was a, like it was a, a whole, a whole singer symphony. I swear I could look at it. I could walk in the room and smell a jammed copier. I'm like, that's what my degree was in, is in requisitioning buses and fixing the copier. <laughs> crazy town and and one one thing that like one glimmer of a, one possible way to get out of that 80 hour morass or at least a little bit is, is enlisting help right which is something i know that's like a big mission of yours and when i got that job that suburban high school job there wasn't a real strong like student leadership system in place or anything like that I implemented one. I give myself maybe a C plus on how I did it and how effective it was. Maybe, probably more like a C. So what should I have done to like really get that, that thing well, coming? First of all, you should have gotten a degree in marketing and gone to work for a bank. Okay, so <laughs> yeah. that, that was your first mistake. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Other than that, assuming that wasn't an option. You know, for me, student leadership is as much about survival as it is about student development. Mm-hmm. I mean, it really is. And it's a win-win because the kids get a better experience and they get growth opportunities that they're not going to get in any other class. And you get the has help that you so desperately need. And so I think there's a couple things. Um, number one, I think you start with very small and very concrete tasks. So when you begin your student leadership program, you start with basically a needs assessment. And not only a needs assessment for the program, but a needs assessment for you as a teacher. What is it that I do each and every day that does not require a master's degree in music? And for me, the experience was I got married at 36 and I had just literally the world's greatest drum major. I mean, this guy was a rock star. I mean, I've had, I've had like you, I mean, just some kids that I would walk across the ends of the earth for it. Mm -hmm. And, but I've had, you know, I would say a handful of kids, 10, 15 kids, I really believe should be president of the United States. And I'm not kidding. They were that good. This was one of those kids. And he walked into my office one day and he said, hey, Mr. Lang, I need you to write down. And this was after he had decorated our room for um, band camp because it was our honeymoon. Um, and he had, you know, organized the whole camp. And all I did was teach and everyone brought us our food. It was truly a honeymoon. The kids brought their suits and tuxes and they, we got remarried. I mean, it was the whole nine yards. And he came to the end of camp and he said, on Monday, I'm going to ask you to do something for me. And I said, okay, what is it? And he said, do you trust me? I said, I do. He said, we'll see you Monday. Came in Monday, handed me a yellow pad of paper. And he said, um, I want you to write down everything you do all day long. And I mean everything. And I was like, I made a joke. I go, you want to know when I pee? And he looks at me and goes, you're an odd little fellow, right? <laughs> and I go, he goes, yeah, write it down. And I go, now you're the odd little fellow, right? You know, <laughs> he goes, just write. So I came back the next day and he goes, where's that pad of paper? And I said, it's right here. And he said, I'll take it. I said, what are you going to do with it? And he said, do you trust me? And I said, yes. Came back the next day on Wednesday and he said, hey, Mr. Lang, um, we have a, a council meeting. I go, yeah, I know. He always did the agenda for the council meeting. I trusted that kid implicitly. He goes, I go, what's on the agenda? He goes, this is on. He hands me the pad back and he had assigned every single thing throughout my day to a student. And I was like, oh my God, uh, no, Brent. And I, I, I was, ah. And he, he looked at me and said, Mr. Lang, I'm going to ask you two questions. I said, what are they? He said, do you like being married? And I, I've been married all of about a month. And I said, yeah, I really do. And he said, I go, what's your next question? He said, do you want to stay married? He said, you work seven days a week. Monday night is, you know, you get, by the way, in Arizona, we rehearse at um, uh, 6 a.m. So I was on site by 4.30 a.m. He goes, Monday night's Monday night rehearsal, Tuesday night's boosters, Wednesday night's color guard, Thursday you're finishing your master's, Friday night football game, Saturday competition, you do paperwork on Sunday. I go to the church across the street, your car's here. He said, you work 92 hours a week, we clocked you. So we're taking over. And for the next year, and I mean a full year, I didn't do anything but show up and teach. 
I lesson planned, I looked at scores, I thought about literature, and it was probably the best band I ever had pound for pound because the kids were so invested in, in the success of the program that they were better students. So the very first thing I would tell any director, start with the needs assessment, not only for your group, choir, band, orchestra, what needs to be done each and every day, chairs set up, whiteboard erased, um, announcements need to be made, bookkeeping needs to be done, warm-ups, everything, even musical or non-musical, just what needs to be done each and every day. And then as a director, what do I need to do each and every day? I need to turn in requisitions, I need to take attendance, I need to do the bookkeeping, I need to do the finances, I need whatever it is. Then take that list and cross everything off, everything off that doesn't require a master's degree in music. And literally, it should come down to two things, lesson or three things, lesson planning, bell-to-bell instruction, and discipline. Those are the only three things student can't be involved in. Mm-hmm. Everything else, you have the ability to assign out. So that would be number one, needs assessment. Number two is finding the right fit to the right person. It's not about titles. I don't want the person in my, is my music librarian who is my music librarian. I want the person who's the most organized, dedicated, diligent, meticulous person. I don't care what their title is. That's what I want. I want my introvert to be my morale officer. I want my extrovert to be my band president. I want my best player to be my section leader, but I want my best kid to be my, you know, vice president. So it, now that you've, you've, you've got your needs assessment, now it's about the puzzle. How do I fit the right piece to the right spot of need? Then when you've got that, now it's the hard part, which is now what's not being done that could be. And that's a little bit more of a visionary. Like, oh my goodness, we don't have anything morale officer oriented. We don't have posters up. We don't have, we don't have any celebrations going on. We don't have a math homework committee. We, uh, and that's the ability to see what's not there that could be there. Um, and so those are the three steps that I would walk someone through. Now, the trick is starting small and then crescendoing big. So start with, you know, you don't start with, hey, can you be a leader of all things ethical? You say, can you pick up the trash in the band room today? Sally, can you stack and rack the chairs in the orchestra room today? Billy, can you assign all the percussion parts out for tomorrow? You start really small, really concrete, and really finite. And as people find success, you hand them more. And, you know, the comment I used to make to my, my kids was, you will never, ever take as much power from me as I'm willing to hand to you. I've got a $100 bill in my hand of singles. You're going to take three of those dollars. I'm willing to give you 100 but I won't hand you anything until you're ready to do it and prepared to do it. You want the band banquet? It's yours, baby. I want requisitions. I want table set up. I want budget. I want ordering information. I want calendaring. I want posters. I want flyers. I want, you show me that, it's yours. But you have to show me you're ready for it in order to take it from me. I think, we, I think we're so fearful as, as music educators a lot of the time of handing the keys to the castle over to people. But if you just, like you're saying, start small and when they're ready, give them more. You, like those, those 80 hours, you might, you're going you're gonna to be spending a lot of time at school regardless, at activities yep. regardless. But those things that you've, you're, you're probably doing a lot that you don't need to be doing, just like you well, said. So here's the thing. There's a study out, and it may be in next week's newsletter. I haven't decided. It almost made it to this week's newsletter, but eh, I wasn't inspired at the moment. <laughs> so next week's newsletter, spoiler alert! If you'd want to read next week's newsletter from Scott Lang and don't want a spoiler alert, turn your volume down now. All right, so spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay, spoiler alert. There was a, a study done recently, and what's, what uh, a scientist did is he handed people – I think it was $100. And he said, you can spend this in any way you want and that will give you the most joy. And then afterwards, we're going to measure your level of satisfaction with how you spent the $100. And what was interesting, um, people who bought things that they wanted experienced a far lower level of satisfaction from their, per- from their expenditures than people who paid someone to do something they didn't want. So the person who bought a new dress didn't experience as much satisfaction as a person who paid someone to clean their house. And the the theory is that your money can buy happiness if you spend it correctly. 
And so I look at student leadership, leadership as an expenditure of happiness. If you can give your student the bus request list and you don't have to do it, there's a fair chance, A, it's going to get done as good or better and quicker because that's their only task. And you gave it to someone who's competent and capable of it. And two, you're going to be a happier teacher because you didn't do it. So I always say that was my happiest year of teaching because all I did was teach. And I, the, the other thing I say is I don't care who you are, whether you're a two teacher or a 10 teacher, um, a new teacher or an old teacher, you're a better teacher when you're happier. If you're a six teacher on a scale of one to 10, when you're unhappy, you're an eight when you're happy. When you're a seven on a scale of one to 10, when you're unhappy, you're a nine when you're happy. No matter who you are, when you're happier, you're a better teacher educator. So do what it takes to be happier. You know, I love, I love this mission that I, that I see you on with the whole be part of the music, be part of the band, be part of the orchestra. And I, I remember sitting in your session a couple of years ago uh, in Tampa and just listening to this. And I think if I remember right, your goal was 1 million new music students. Is that right? Yep. Yep, that? Okay. Okay. Yep. And, and I each think and every year, each, each and, and every year. Okay. And I, I think we're, we're so many of us get caught in this scarcity mindset in terms of students. And we're looking and, Oh, this, the middle school numbers coming in next year. I've got like 10 less. Oh, that's going to affect sectioning, whatever. And I just love how you reframe that. No, what we're going to do is a million new students every year. How the heck can we get a million new uh, people in, in music every year? T talk about that. I don't know, and if any one of your le listeners has an idea, feel free to call me at 480-577-5264. That'd be great. <laughs> no, here's the bottom line. There's, there's really, in my opinion, there's two ways to do advocacy. One is the top down, one is the bottom up. So the top down is policy wonk and politicking and legislative, and I call that top down advocacy. The other way is my approach, which is bottom up. And the thing is, is that's the one thing that's in our control. I can't control what my state legislature does, my school board does, my governor does. I can't even control what my superintendent principal does. You know what I can control? My enrollment. We have a resource for everything in music education. If you don't know how to finger something on the bass, we got a resource. If you don't know much about bass, there's a podcast for that. If you if you don't understand what literature to play at contests, there's a, the teaching performance. Of music. If you don't know how to breathe, there's two, not one, but two breathing series out there. If you can't breathe, if you can't breathe, you have bigger problems in life than, you know, whether you can play in tune or not. But the one thing that fixes everything, we have nothing for. If you want better facilities, you know what the answer is? Get more kids. You want more faculty involved? Get more kids. You want better bases? You know what you should do? Get more bases. You want an assistant get more bases. You want more instrument, get more kids. It's the one thing that solves everything. And beyond that, it's an immediate fix that literally, if I can recruit more kids into sixth grade orchestra within two and a half years, my life gets better. So my, my thought is number one, it's low hanging fruit. Number two, it does the most good in the most immediate fashion. And number three, it, it's something that I can control in my life. We finish up our conversation today digging into Be Part of the Music and the whole journey that Scott went through starting Be Part of the Band, where it started, how it developed, and where it's going. It's truly inspiring what Scott's doing. I'm just such a fan. And I know you'll love hearing how this whole thing evolved. And I want to give a shout out to our last couple of sponsors today. That is the A440 Violin Shop, which is based in Chicago, just west of beautiful Wrigley Field. Such a great neighborhood. You can even take the train if you want to risk getting your base on the train. Take that. Get off on Roscoe. They're right there in Chicago. They sell bases. They sell bows. They do repairs, restorations. They set up students with rentals. I've had them do everything on that list and more for my students back in Chicago. Check them out, a440violinshop.com. And if you're in the southeastern United States, you got to check out the Bass Violin Shop. Mark Ridge says the Bass Violin Shop is definitely the place to go for all your bass needs. Bob and his staff are very professional, knowledgeable, and helpful. Thank you, Bob, for helping us out of our dilemma. I like doing business with a man that will take the time to talk to me 
and help me out. Sometimes things are not always cut and dried, and Bob went out of his way to be helpful and meet our needs. When it comes time to buy our bass, we will be back to the bass violin shop. That's a great endorsement, and you can find more like that and everything they're all about at their website, BassViolinShop.com. All right, back to the last part of our conversation with Scott Lang. So what I did was um, I, I put out a product called Be Part of the Band, and it was it's behind me on my shelf. And it was designed to keep kids in, in, in school from middle school to high school because that's my wonk. That's my place, high school. And it was, you know, documents. The theory was if we give people really cool video materials, we give them really cool documents for parents, counselors, administrators, and teachers, that it literally becomes recruitment in a can. It's literally stupid, simple, and it's high quality. Because band directors may be great podium directors, but they're not great marketers, which is what recruiting is. And they don't have the time to put together or the expertise to put together quality materials. So the theory was, we'll give you everything you need, and it will be customizable. You can put your school logo on it, your name, everything. So we put it out there, and it did really well as a product. I mean, as you know in publishing, really well means you made enough to go to Starbucks and get a latte that day. Um, But it, it sold fairly well, and we loved it. And I was hanging out with my good friends in the Boston Brass one night because when you do the music education circuit, and I call it a circuit, you almost see each other every week in a different state. And I pulled in in Pennsylvania. It was like, oh, 11 o'clock at night. And I walk in and there's Jeff Connor with uh, the Boston Brass. And I'm like, Jeff. And we gave each other a hug and a high five. And um, in fact, I ran him doing at an airport last week in Columbus, Ohio. Um, anyway, nice. You like my no segue there? I just took right turn next <laughs> It's, it, yeah, for those of you who, uh, who are at home, and uh, stay tuned and don't turn the volume down. You may miss a whole segue there. So anyway, and I said, what are you doing? He said, well, we're doing advocacy work. And I said, I laughed and we're really good buddies because they are so darn good. I just adore them. And they're great human beings. I said, well, that's dumb. And I said, he said, why? And I said, well, everyone who's here already loves music. Well, you're preaching to the choir, my friend. And he said, well, then what would you do? And so I said, I would do this thing called be part of the music. I'd sketch it out. It's all built on be part of the band and it would be all these things. And he said, well, why don't you? I said, well, gosh, I'm not in the elementary scene. It's not my thing. And, you know, I made excuses. And he said, put up or shut up, dude. If you're not going to do it, who is? And if not now, when? So it really got in my skin. And I called my team. They're all volunteers. Um, uh, They're all in different professions, but they were all once in my band. And, and they helped me do be part of the band. Uh, the guy who did my video works in marketing and pharma sales, the girl who did all my written work and editing, she's, you know, a stay at home mom and in the nonprofit sector. And but anyway, and I said, guys, we're going to do this. And they said, okay, makes sense. And I said, but here's the kick. If we don't give it away, it doesn't work. So we have to do it for free. We have to go find money. It's a different model than we've, than we've ever done. And so we came out with be part of the band and we were super stoked. We loved it. Um, and it did great good in the world. Mm-hmm. So we did a study that basically said um, what impact it had. And what we found was if you used our materials, we saw an annualized growth of 11.5% year over year from people who didn't use our materials and an additional student growth of, um, of um, 20.3 students per teacher. So if you're an elementary teacher and you teach at three elementary schools, that's an annualized growth of 60 students per year. For that teacher, typically there are six elementary schools to a middle school, so or to two middle schools and two middle schools to a high school. When you anal- annualize that, that's 264 additional new kids to music if we can keep them in music. The numbers were staggering. They blew even our minds. We're like, oh my goodness, this works. So we're pretty pleased with ourselves. And I was at Midwest um, three years ago, and I got stopped by Joe Lamond and Rick Young, and they said, you know, We'd like to talk with you. Do you know who we are? And I said, sure. You're Joe Lamond and you're Rick Young. They said, that's correct. They said, <laughs> I said, the more important question is, how do you know who I am? And they said, we've been watching your be part of the music, your be part of the band stuff for a year. And I said, okay. And they said, we want to know what's next. And I said, absolutely nothing. And they, you know, they kind of laughed and said, why? And I said, because I'm out of time and money. Um, because my team and I, we donated about half of what it took to fund that. And then music for all in Jupiter paid the rest. And I said, I can't spend any more time and money on this. I really can't. And, um, Joe Lamont said, I didn't ask you if you were going to do it. I said, what would be next? Do you have a plan? I said, Oh yeah, it's called be part of the music. And I sketched it all out on the napkin form. I said, that's what needs to happen. And he said, if I helped you, 
would you do it? So I basically gave him a benchmark and said, I'll give you 90 days. And if you can help me raise enough to do this right, I'll do it. But if we don't have the money on day 91, we're out. And Rick Young said, I'm Rick Young was phenomenal. Um, he, uh, he just retired from Yamaha. He said, my Rolodex is your Rolodex now. And I will help you. And, um, you know, Joe Lamond and the folks at NAM have been phenomenal. And they said, here's a pass to NAM. It's in three weeks. I'll set up your meetings. And we went to work. And we didn't raise enough money. But we got close enough I thought I could. And so we made the leap. So it's basically, it's, a, it's, it's three elementary products. Be part of the band. Be part of the choir. Be part of the orchestra. It's a middle school product, stay in music middle school, and it's a high school product, stay in music in high school, and then there's a teacher, student um, component to get, make people want to be music educators. We have finished two of the three elementary products, and we've done both the middle school and the high school product. Um, we're currently scheduling and calendaring be part of the choir um, for the coming months. So we're, we really... Um, are almost done with the hard physical product. But what we've done in extension of that now is come up with a whole bunch of different new things. We just launched a national parent newsletter, which um, is really something special that your teachers should know about. Because the beauty is, after years of looking and searching, um, we've found and tweaked a piece of software so that we write all the content, but it looks like it comes from the teacher. And it comes from the teacher's email address with the teacher's name on it and the teacher's school. Because the beauty is, and there's another non sequitur, um, is that when we're talking about advocacy, the problem with advocacy is really twofold. Number one, um, it's either static content, meaning we've got a beautiful website, but it doesn't change for five years. Or two, the only people who see it and go to it are people who are already believers. Our thought process was once again, it doesn't help to convert the already converted. You're not going to get more religious. That's not the point. The point is take the non-believer and convert them. And so we wrote these emails and they're, they're, they're time driven, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, but they're also um, uh, level driven, elementary music, returning music, middle school, high school, band, choir, orchestra. So it's really five different tracks of newsletters and they speak specifically to that track specifically the time of the year. So when a, when a parent, um, when a, um, a teacher goes to, to upload their list, they say this is elementary orchestra beginners and hear their parent email addresses and they give us 150, you know, whatever, 200 email addresses. Well, then these non-believers, these bankers, these dry cleaners, these office workers, these whatever they do for a living, entrepreneurs who don't know the value of music are now getting monthly regular content about the importance of music in their child's life and it's written for the parent perspective so we're now delivering dynamic content that's that's level driven that's calendar driven to the non-believer it's i mean it's revolutionary and transformative we believe we opened it up about three weeks ago we're already at ten thousand parents we believe by december we'll be at fifty thousand and we believe um, it's very reasonable, very attainable. Um, by next year, we'll be at over 100,000 parents. Non, and the key is 100,000 non-believers. And, and it's, it's a win-win. We get to advocate for music, and the, the teacher gets high-quality, visually well-written content that comes from them, and they do nothing. Now, back around to the subject matter. <laughs> I'm really, I don't even know why you interview me. This is exactly, this is exactly why I wanted you on the podcast, Scott. I just want, I just want to get you on Skype and do your thing. That's it's How great. are you going to edit this down to something? Where it's, All right, back to the question. <laughs> GPS, take left turn, head back to question. If we can get, if we can get, we did a second data study a year ago, and we found that the numbers in the first study were not only true, but they were low. Our latest study suggests 17.5% additional students per school and 22% annualized growth. When you take those numbers and you're talking about 17 kids, we'll, we'll round it down to 10. If I can get this in 10,000 schools, which in theory is 3,000 teachers, because the average elementary school teacher teaches at three schools, 3,000 teachers. 
in 10,000 schools, we're talking about now 100,000 additional kids. And that's rounding down from 17 to 10. If you use the real numbers, we're talking about 170,000 kids. If I can get it in 6,000 teachers' hands, there's basically 25,000 um, elementary uh, music teachers that are band or choir or orchestra. If I can get it in 6,000, now we're talking almost just shy of a half million. We haven't even started talking about choir or orchestra yet. I mean, you can see where the numbers explode. Yeah. But the, the key is distribution, awareness and distribution. And that is, that is something we struggle with because there's no mathematical way to count that. Now, I can count how many people are registered with us, how many people are in our database, in our system, have come here. I can tell you where they live and all that stuff, but I can't track, A, what they're using and how they're using it, and B, um, when they're using it, what's effectiveness is. When we do our survey, we get great data back, and we get a big sample. Our, I think our last survey had 600 respondents, which is a big pool. Mm -hmm. You know, Anything over 100 is statistically valid. But boy, I don't know in Florida what my orchestra demographic looks like. I don't know in Wisconsin middle school how often they're using this. I can paint with broad brushes, but I can't paint with small brushes. And I have yet to come across anyone who can give me a model to build that. So we are using analytics and we feel comfortable that the numbers we're putting out are absolutely 100% verifiable and accurate. We feel comfortable that a million people is not a pie in the sky belief. What we're not comfortable with, how do we measure if we got there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my Achilles heel. That is my, my windmill. That is my Trojan horse. Well, what a, what a great way to help all of us out there in the trenches doing these, you know, high school, middle school, elementary school, band, orchestra, choir, and help us all with what we're not trained to do. Kind of circling back to what we were talking about at the beginning, marketing, right? right. Speaking to people in a language that they connect with. And I shudder at some of these emails I sent out to, and I'm, I kind of am in marketing. I mean, this is what I do. And, right. I, yeah. I, sent, and I sent these horrible emails to parents in retrospect, you know, these is like, like messes of also, and, and I'm sure like getting deleted or not, or confusing and like certainly not helping the cause of music, you know, and, and, and it's just, so I, I've checked out a lot of what you've got on the site and I love this new uh, periodic uh, update system that how cool is that? Everybody needs to go and, and get their yeah. lists on there. Um, and like be part of the orchestra, for example, I, I remember watching, you've got all these videos of like, starting the instrument these really high quality videos right. and and video what well, like can you just talk through some of the in addition to this email says like what all is there so everyone needs to go to www.bepartofthemusic.org and when you get there it's going to ask you um are you a parent of an elementary are you a parent of a middle school are you a parent of a high school or are you a music teacher you want to choose music teacher because that gives you back end access to everything Basically, the content loads dynamically based on who you are. So if you're a parent of elementary school, you only see elementary videos. If you're a parent of middle school, so on and so forth. When you get there, you'll see that we have these programs. Be part of the orchestra. Be part of the band. Stay in music middle school. Stay in music in high school. So we actually have another video that explains how to use all that. Then below that, we have resources. We have beyond the videos. We have, PDF, or we have documents that are all Microsoft Word that allow you to do all your communication and everything. And you can either print and use it as is or email it as is. There's tweets. There's Facebook quotes. There's parent letters. There's administrative letters. There's counselor letters. There's everything. Sign-up sheets, certificates for kids who make it, everything. And it's all 100% customizable. So you can print, use as is. You can put your school logo on. Nobody will know that we exist. And it's all free. We also have... Um, instrument demonstration videos and, 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 and videos for all the stakeholders. We designed those, by the way, and we designed the website. We did it based on Disney and Apple. If you look at our aesthetic and our approach to video making, it mirrors Disney. So Disney always does pre-sequences before the title sequence to get you hooked in. They always involve teenagers or early 20-somethings. They don't ever involve adults in their videos. Um, and Apple uses a white, clean, and silver aesthetic. So we figured these are the two best marketing companies to that demographic. We're going to copy them. So every video starts with a pre-sequence before a title sequence. Um, everything is shot on white, so it's timely. Everything is done with teenagers. And even though they may not be a professional violinist, it's good enough for a fifth grader. Then 
Below that, we have other resources. We have recruitment kits. We have banners, things that you can use to literally walk out and go walk into a classroom. Here's a pencil. Here's a rubber band. Here's a here's a poster for the, to go around. It's everything. And then we have the parent advocacy uh, newsletters and Google Docs. So all of this stuff, I want to stress, with the exception of the recruitment kits, we charge cost, is 100% free to every educator. And I always call it, it's like ordering dinner. Pick an appetizer, pick a main course, and pick a dessert. You pick what you want, take as much as you want, leave as much as you want behind. My job is to tell you how to recruit. My job is to give you every resource available so that you can do it well. So I have, I mean, top five programs that play at Midwest every four years and have 400 kids in the program, and they use just the videos and not the documents. I have people that use the videos and the documents. I have people that use only the documents. I have people that use the documents and customize them. I have people who use the main video, but not the instrument demonstration. It, it literally, and the thing is, it's all social media compliant. So you can send this all electronically to parents. So if they don't come to a meet the teacher in the night, or they don't come in and say, my kid's thinking about quitting, you can still send those resources out to be digested and consumed to every parent on any mobile friendly device. It's, it's it's remarkable. It, it, you talk about solving so many problems for the music teachers so that they can spend the time doing what they're in this for, right? S- working with the kids work and, and, and taking some of that bureaucracy, that load, like we were talking about earlier, you know, off. And I, I just could, thank you so much for doing this. It's a whole heap of work. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's been fun to to follow along with it the last couple of years, and it's just cool to see it continue to evolve. And it's a passion project for sure, and that's what I call it. And I would encourage literally every listener out there go to the site. Not only you know, even if you're not a teacher, if you're a, a bass player or a string player, or just a passionate about music education, and take a look at it. And and if you have thoughts or ideas, or you want to jump in and help, boy, we sure could use it. We call ourselves a band of merry brothers, and. Um, we, we all do it out of the love of our heart. Um, I make my living traveling the road talking about leadership, but I make my soul uh, grow through being part of the music. And we have, like, we have a gentleman who found our stuff, and he's like, why don't you have anything for Spanish? I'm like, time. And he goes, I speak Spanish. I'll translate all your documents. So it's all going to be um, Spanish compliant probably in the next three weeks. And it's just someone who saw the resources and said, I have something to give to the cause. Um, the, the newsletters that were all written were by an, an elementary teacher and a middle school teacher. And they said, listen, if you'll write the high school track, we'll write the elementary and middle school track because that's our space. And, you know, um, Greg Scapolito and uh, Wendy Higdon did that for me. And so, you know, it's we want it to be a communal effort. So if there's anyone out there in listener land, um, you know, because my reader database consists of my mother and my golden retriever and um, who wants to join in that process, visit us at, at bepartofthemusic.org and send us a note, a call, um, spray paint our car. We're not really you know, particular about how you communicate. Um, just say, I want to help. And here's what my skill sets are. And um, you're helping right now by spreading the message. And we, we couldn't appreciate it anymore. Thanks for what you do. Well, I, I'm so thrilled to have you on the podcast. I got to say, when I heard you talk in Tampa, I had, I, in the back of my mind, I was like, I need to get Scott on the podcast somehow. So I'm so glad that, that you've uh, found the time to, to chat. And people definitely, if they're not following along, need to get on your newsletter no, and get this. Everybody it's, left him after minute two. Let's oh, be clear. Yeah, right. they, yeah, they're yeah. like, this chuckle ahead. I want to hear more <laughs> about string bass. And, and so, um, you know, uh, I know nothing about spring bass. I think I got a C plus in my strings method class and, and the bass was twice as tall as me and my fingers weren't long enough. So I pretty much raised the white flag. If I'd have had your podcast, maybe I would have gotten a beat. No, I probably wouldn't have. Let's not get ourselves. Scott, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for chatting. I'm so glad that we got the chance to chat for the podcast. I've been a fan for years. And the first time I heard you speak, I said, we got to get Scott in the podcast. Got to find a way to do that. So it's such a thrill to have you on the show. And folks, you got 
got to check out bepartofthemusic.org. Dig into that. No matter if you teach private bass or you're an orchestra director or a general music teacher or any kind of teacher or a parent or a student, check out this site. It is a wicked resource. And you got to follow along with Scott, scottlang.net. Follow him on Facebook. Follow him on Twitter. Get on his email list. He is hilarious. He is insightful. He'll really make you think. He'll just really, he's a, he's a great, great, great resource and he's an inspiring guy so thank you scott thank you for listening folks if this is your first episode welcome <laughs> we've done a lot and you can find all of them at contrabaseconversations.com and i'd encourage you to check out our app contrabaseconversations.com slash app and that is for ios that's for android that's for kindle it's totally free it's a great way to search the episodes we have all sorts of extra bonus things in that app like scale sheets and books and articles and videos and all that kind of thing it's totally free and we've got five thousand people that have installed that app isn't that crazy five thousand wow all the cool kids are doing it definitely pick up a copy if you haven't and We will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.